Uh, hi, Mr. Abraham, how are you? Good, how's yourself, Ethan? You hear me okay? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining me. I uh, I know it's already tomorrow there in Australia, so I'm still on Wednesday, my time. Um, thank you again for taking the time to join me. It means a lot to me. No, that's good. Thanks for the reach out. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I stumbled into finding in, uh, Tetrionics kind of, I guess some would say accidentally or coincidentally, and uh, it sort of started aligning with a lot of the the thoughts or, or insights kind of things I, I was having on, on the nature of physics and not that my insights are anything new or, or anything like that, but um, it seemed to align with the idea of geometry um, being something fundamentally mm. necessary to understanding a lot of these concepts. And uh, that's kind of how I ended up looking into tetrionics and have, so, have since really tried to delve into it the best I can with my uh, simple mind and uh, thought maybe coming on and talking with you would help, would help uh, bring some light to some of these things that I had some questions on. And I just really wanted to, to start by kind of asking you what what brought you to developing this this um, groundbreaking kind of idea and this in this theory, unified field theory and um, what it means to you kind of um, if you don't mind no that's fine I mean like I didn't set out to do it obviously it, it's something that organically grew over time um, as I worked out more and more more things fell into place and it kept going. My background is electrical engineering, telecommunications, data, that sort of stuff. Um, I found myself at a crossroads and a lot of spare time on my hands, to cut a long story short. And I basically sat down and started, I think I've still got some models here, um, sat down and started fiddling with some shapes. And from an early age, one of the things in school that they got me into is that square numbers pop up everywhere in physics and as i started playing around with shapes i quickly went to the equilateral triangle i don't know if you can see that at all yes uh, but what i immediately discovered from that was that when you place one equilateral triangle you can place three below it one and three is four and then i just kept following and all the squared numbers came out and i thought well that's rather cool and didn't think too much further except to start drawing and folding and making paper models in the hope that it might lead to a bit of understanding where there was holes. Obviously, high school drums in the basics of chemistry and physics and biology. And it also lets you know that there's some gaping holes in there. Once I finished my training in electrical engineering, I sort of felt that I had a fair understanding of how things work and how it all fits together and knew that we didn't know it all. Obviously, there's this search for a unified theory, as you mentioned. And at that point, I thought, well, maybe this is where we've all gone wrong. We've been using the mathematics as a tool without a physical model to underpin it. And this idea of the squared numbers being there sort of shook me and I, I started seeing how I could apply it to concepts at quantum mechanics and going from there. You start with the, the squared numbers, obviously, but if instead of going left to right, you go up and down, those same numbers give you a distribution curve, which is also present quite distinctly in math, in quantum mechanics. And it's the, the reason why they say there's a lot of uncertainty in, uh, in quantum, at the quantum scale. So I thought, well, what if all that uncertainty wasn't anything else, but just a, a function of how we measure these triangles? at the small scale and then model them mathematically at the larger scale. But in the meantime, we've had no rigid geometry. We never thought about using triangles. All our work on triangle, equilateral triangles basically comes down to three equal sides, three equal angles, and you can mirror them and rotate them. And that's about it for equilateral triangles. Euclid's got 13 books out there. There's one paragraph about equilateral triangles and stops. So I started delving into it and I started writing up what I discovered and, and fine tuning and produced my first idea in 2008. Um, and well, it's time to put it all into a PDF and put out what I discovered and worked out. 2012 version two was released to the internet and it covered quantum mechanics 
my own particular preference, which was uh, QED, electrical theory, yep. which is Maxwell and all the rest. Did uh, chemistry, which is a story unto itself, uh, cosmology, and then a small <clears> book <throat> on mathematics, just because I know that the, the thing I discovered really quickly was that there's a cognitive dissonance between what people are taught and their construct of what a squared number is. They don't immediately think, and even when shown that equilateral triangles are just straight squared numbers, they don't grasp the, the, the fallout from a, from a physics or science perspective of what that does. What it does do is it gives us a rigid model work for all the mathematics that's in physics and chemistry and biology, etc., to then build these models for example, you can build the, the quarks that go into baryons. You can see how they interact by their charges to form a unique icosahedral shape. So instead of being spherical, they've got a very distinct pushed in ball shape that serves a very particular function. Um, when I first mapped the, uh, the standard element or standard models table, I came up with a new model which was a tetrion, and I had a particle, which was just a tetrahedra, the first shape you make with four triangles of mass matter, forming material matter, three-dimensional. So I had to give it a name, so I called it a tetrion, hence the name tetrionics. Yep. But you could see from the, the one plank coin, which has a positive, hold that up, one plank coin can have a positive charge, and then through the mirror symmetry, the exact opposite charge on the other side. So every chunk of energy, i.e. Planck's constant, made up of millions upon trillions of countless triangles, has a duality. It has a positive and a negative. There's an electrical equivalent to that, to this shape of the equilateral triangle, Planck's coin, as I call it. And that is a wired inductor that's been short-circuited. At the quantum level, it doesn't lose energy, but the energy circulates through the short-circuited inductor. And what that creates is a north and south magnetic bar make. And then viewed from the other side, the magnetic fields are reversed. Those, that shape, those arrangements, be it electrical equivalent or the geometric equivalent, form what are called bosons. Two of them come together via their magnetics to form an, an electrics form photons, then you have tetrions and all the standard particle models. The only difference is that there's this factor of 12 with the charges. So in the case of an electron, we have a very distinct three tetrahedra shape, which is a quantum rotor made up of three ch of 12 charges. Now there can be 12 negative charges for the electron, 12 positive charges for the positron, or a mixture, a balanced mixture of positive and negative, which gives us the neutrinos. But all the mass energy for those particles is in the charges and in the number of these Planck coins that make it up. So from nature's perspective, it's doing nothing more than a Lego constructor set. And it's just saying, if I throw countless numbers of these coins in there with positive and negative on either side, and just let them do their thing, what do we get? We get neutrinos, tetrions, we get baryons, quarks. They all come out of this soup along with photons. And the universe is created. It's just a, 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 we, it's a outcome of positive and negative charges interacting, pushing and pulling until they form these shapes. And then they go on for larger scale things like in cosmology or even in biology itself. These little atoms can combine. A uh, brand new periodic table came out. Um, a new understanding of uh, how stars work, how galaxies work and things that you've touched on, dark matter, dark energy. It, yep. it all flows out once you have this rigid model. And the beauty of it was I got stuck on chemistry for two years. I could not build the uh, the basic elements past element 160 because as you go to build them you have excess neutrons and it's it's an open question in chemistry how does a proton attract a neutral particle to form larger elements 
Yeah, yeah. I, I'll say, and not to interrupt you there, but I, I actually did notate that kind of um, looking at tetrionics. There's this abundance of, of neutrons. There's this abundance of the neutral charge, it seems to me. And then with isotopes in chemistry, whenever you have carbon 14, 16, you have this varying amount of neutrons within the nucleus. And to me, as they radiate the, or as they degrade or decay um, radioactively and such, they, they begin to lose the total mass of neutrons in the nucleus, which um, kind of made me wonder um, how that fits into tetrionics and the chemistry side as far as the abundance of, of neutrons compared to protons. And, and is that imbalance there between positive, negative, and neutral um, a key aspect to, to how this got thrown off to, to basically put into motion, maybe, so to speak, the, um, the formation of, of three-dimensional shapes and, and this idea. The, the shapes were there. The, the, the basic atoms, when you look at the electron and the pro, or the deuterium atom, proton, neutron, electron, come together and they form something that Tesla would recognize immediately in Westinghouse, and that's a motor. It's a, a stator with a rotating component being the electron. So on the, at the quantum scale, you can say it's an engineered design. You've got these funny shaped protons and neutrons that don't look like little round balls as they're often pictured in physics. They are in fact, um, just for example, if you can still see that, that is the classical model of a proton. Yeah, Same Mr. Thing. Abraham, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, are you sharing the screen right now? I didn't, I didn't know if I was supposed to be seeing it. Uh, that could be my end. Bear with me. I'll find Zoom again. Make sure it is on share. And that'll be why it's not. Uh, there we there go. We go. Oh, okay. All right. Now, now I got it. My apologies. <laughs> you have your classical model. Whoops, this is going to be fun. Uh -huh. Classical model of a proton. Now, bearing in mind that everything's made up of tetrahedra in tetrionics, the proton, as it's classically drawn and described, is replaced with an icosahedral shape. And it's, whoops, get it there. Very different. I should probably drop my background to make it a bit easier. Oh, I see. I see the, I see the G. Yeah, that makes, that makes yeah. it easier to conceptualize. There's, there's actually three quarks holding that together. It will open up. And you can see it's got positive and negative charges. In the case of a proton, you have 24 positive charges holding it, making it up, and 12 negative. Now, the mirror image, well, one of the mirror images of that is obviously the neutron. Again, whoops, it's all backwards. It's not that. In tetrionics, it's actually this, which looks very similar at initial glance. To the first one, yeah. There's much between them, but in this case, with the when it wants to show up, with the neutron, you have a balance of twelve negatives and twelve positives, which gives it a neutral charge, even though it's comprised of charges. I see. Neutral in general. And, that, and the quantum, the quantum coin, as 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 it's been referred to, is what the fundamental element of that neutron is, and it's made up of the inverse side of that coin essentially folding Inside the matter is the opposite charge exactly and okay it's, it's not exposed you can't detect it because if you you go to sense it with opposite charges to push and pull or magnetic dipoles to move it around you'll never sense what's inside the the tetrahedral shape and nice. i refer to that space inside as null space because where you've got the coins forming a tetrahedra what they actually do is two functions. And this leads back to some of your questions again. The, the tetrahedra being made of, of electromagnetic energy, that is really short messing around. Yeah, yeah, the green screen's playing tricks on you. I'll have to try and drop that out if I can. Um, um, yeah. The but, in my Zoom settings, I imagine. On the Zoom. Stop the video. This is a background. I'll drop it to none. I'll just go blur, it might be better. Try that. 
and then I'll stop the video and see if that helps. Okay. Yeah, that, that might make it a little easier. Yeah. So that's a little bit better, still getting blurry, but that's what was called like quantum indeterminacy. <laughs> uh, positive and the negative charges that make it up have two functions. One is is the energy or the number of quanta in each face is the mass of the object. So you can start off with just four quanta to make a tetrahedra, and then 12 of them would make a neutrino, making it very, very light. But its physical shape would be exactly the same as an electron, except the electron actually has one by 10 to the 19 charges or plain coins for each single charge in a neutrino. So by having more energy and more coins, it weighs more despite having the exact same physical dimension. So the brain's used to perceiving something light as being something smaller. Yep. In this case, in the quantum realm, it's no longer smaller. It just has less plank coins making it up. So back to the, the two models we had here of the neutron and the proton. We then exchange them using tetrahedra, or we make them up as nature does. And we have the two models here, protons and neutrons. But interestingly enough, despite being identical shapes, they have vastly different charges, plus 12 and neutral, because of the, the, the equal and opposite charges balancing out. And the neutron, you have 19 so 18 and 18, equally a positive and negative. And it's the three quarks, the, the neutron gives you the easiest way to visualize the three quarks. You can see the black are the down quarks. The red is the up quark in the middle there. Whereas with the proton, you have two ups and a down in the middle. Wow, okay. Well, that really helps conceptualize the geometry of the tetrahedron seems crit obviously it's critical to this. It's critical because it, it's, it's again, this is how nature does it. And what happens is the opposite charges in those shapes, even despite the electron, the proton, the, sorry, the neutron being neutral, what can happen is the opposite charges come together on their faces by the, this residual strong force. Okay. And you end up with a very specific shape, if I can get it in there in screen. Okay. And, and there are CAD and models of these that you can download and, and view, or you can make your own paper ones. It's probably better. That little slot there is where the quantum rotor or the electron actually sits in by the magnetic dipole and spins. That, if you view it as an electrical engineer, any engineer or anybody that's worked with electrical motors would recognize that as the housing for a generator. And then in there you have the slot for your shaft or your rotor. Westinghouse's rotors that he used to store energy and supply to the subway system in San Francisco and LA, things like that. So in one foul swoop, because the electron is no longer, well, it's still a neutral charge, but because it's made up of an equal number of positive and negative charges that are exactly the opposite of what the protons are, we now have an explanation of why the protons can be attracted to neutrons to bind okay. together. And so what they're going to be drawn that, together. That, yeah, that makes and really intuitive the sense. Way. They're going to be drawn and rotated so that those positive and negative charges line them up. They won't form backwards or sideways. They will always line up in that particular arrangement that allows the electron, the hole to form for the electron to be pinned and captured. So deuterium is just a natural happening and it'll happen everywhere in the universe. There's nothing magical to explain it. Okay, it's, and then that, that would postulate. And, okay, and, and, and as far as how that relates to the strong atomic force as, as it's referred to, um, that, that basically explains the mechanis mechanism behind what the strong, that the strong nuclear force is really electromagnetism yeah. at its core. If, if you were to pull a, pro a proton apart, you would have up, down and up quarks. If you can see them there, it is confusing when you're on a mirror. You can see they all have charged faces everywhere, but you can see the black negative charged faces attract to the positive, the red ones. And they fold up like that. Where they fold up and the coplanar faces of the tetrahedra come together, 
that's your strong force. It's sticking like two sheets of glass with a bit of water in between them, the electric and the magnetic, the two fascia of the tetrahedra of the, the quarks themselves. Get it back in there. Come together like that. And that's your strong force. Wow. Mr. Blurring would stop, sort of spoils it. So, so that removes the cloud of strong force is the bit that's oh, holding it in that shape. The weak force is, is different again. The weak force is basically the magnetic dipole of your plank charges. Um, when you put, uh, when you create a um, again a, a lepton with twelve faces, twelve charges. If they're 12 positive or 12 negative, the way they come together is electrostatically. The plus and minuses, again, will, oops, I can remember where that camera is. The faces will come together and you'll see that the north and the south don't cancel out, but they neutralize. Where there's a north, there's a south at all times, because it's, in this case, the negative charge is making up the lepton. So if you go to sense the lepton, you won't sense any magnetic fields because they're all canceled out. If you bring a, a bar magnet in to try and detect the magnetic field on this, there's 24 of them on the lepton. 12 of them are gonna be north, 12 are gonna be south. So it doesn't matter which dot, which end of the pole of the magnetic pointer you bring in, you're gonna have a push, an equal amount of pushing and pulling between the opposite magnetic fields. So, from a, a test point of view, you'll say this object has no magnetic field of its own, but it has 12 negative charges making it up. So it's got exactly the same charge, but opposite to that of a proton, which has 24 positive and 12 negative, giving it a plus 12. Plus 12, minus 12. Electron, different shape entirely to what the proton is, but the proton, with its identical shape to a neutron, is exactly the opposite charges, which brings them together to form this unique model. Now, this is just your deuterium atom. And what happens is, think of it as a D cell battery. You've got a positive and a negative end on your battery. And likewise, with atoms, they have a positive end. Get it? and a negative end. And just like batteries, they can be stacked on top of each other or beside each other. Now for two years, I had the, the basics of tetrionics all worked out in my head and writing it out on paper. And I didn't have a strong like for chemistry in, in high school, to be honest, but I knew that chemistry had to be explained as part of tetrionics, otherwise it was dead in the water. If I can't explain it, then the theories no go. It's not a unified theory. It's not a theory at all. It's just a lovely little model. So for two years, I tried to build atoms based on what I call excess neutrons. When they discovered the atoms, they had equal number of protons and electrons, obviously. And then when they measured their masses for particularly higher energy or heavier um, elements, adding up the electrons and the protons gave an insufficient number. And then Chadwick discovered the neutrino and the neutron and went, there's our missing mass. So in order to make the, the mass work out, the electron had, the, sorry, the neutron had to be slightly heavier for two reasons. One, they needed to account for the mass, and two, they needed to explain how the neutron became neutral in the first place, and yet was similar size to the proton. So their observations showed that beta decay occurs where after a while in an atom, out will pop a proton and an electron. So they assumed, and this is where what happens when you don't have strong physical models of the mathematics, the reverse can be applied. They said, well, if you bring the electron and the proton close together, one will absorb the other. Two masses will still exist, but the charge will be neutral. So by extrapolation, neutrons must be slightly heavier in the nucleus than protons to allow for beta decay to occur. So it's called reverse beta decay. 
I knew from my model that the protons and the neutrons were exactly the same mass, exactly the same shape, differed only in charge. And I knew what the charge of, and the mass of the electron was as well. So I started doing the spreadsheets and putting it together. And I quickly discovered that now that I've explained how the, the protons are attracted, how neutrons are attracted to protons to start building these larger atoms, that was one problem solved. The second problem solved came up when I got to the point where as you build these atoms together with these nuclei, you get to a point where you can't join a neutron to a neutron because you have you don't have the opposite charges. Trying to add one neutron on top of another neutron, you won't have the down quarks in the right spot for them to come together. So they won't stick. The neutrons will not stick to each other, just like protons will not stick to each other. So for two years, I struggled and I thought, I've, this is it. This is my stumbling block. I've explained how to build them. And then out of the blue, after two years, I was just sitting there in sheer desperation going, what am I missing? And I reverted back to the model. I said, how do I, what's the model telling me that I'm not getting? And then I started thinking about the, the batteries again, one on top of the other. And clear logic, if you put a one and a half volt battery on top of another one and a half volt battery, it's not one and a half volts anymore, it's three. Yeah. It's just like Schrodinger's equation. You're going from one energy level, slap the next battery on top, you've got a second energy level. Another battery gives you a third energy level, a fourth, a fifth, and up it builds. I thought, well, okay, that's interesting. So I built the new spreadsheet and I incorporated Schrodinger's numbers, the principal energy level, along with the spin and all the rest. And then lo and behold, I didn't need excess neutrons because when you add Schrodinger's wave function with the different principal energy levels that accounts for the mass so as you increase the you've got n1 deuterium nuclei at the base then n2 deuterium nuclei at the next level they're heavier and n3 is heavier again and when you do the math and add it all up in the spreadsheet out pops everything without the need for excess neutrons because okay. it's not the neutrons or the excess neutrons that have to be added into it create all this extra mass that was always there. It's just energizing or increasing the rest mass of those deuterium nuclei. Okay. And it gave me a whole brand new periodic table. It gave, it also gave me a whole brand new shape to the, the atom, which is akin to a top like this. Oh. So when I, if I just pull down, I can send you these, they're on the web page. Just take it down off the wall and get back a bit. When okay, you yeah. get all the, the Z numbers, and there it is, it's blurring again. That's okay. Um, you end up with that top shape. Yep. But going from M1 at the bottom to N8 at the top, you also notice that you've got SPDF orbitals, but you don't have GH and I orbitals. At SPDF, it reverses and becomes the top shape again, back okay. to this shape. And and real quick, if I just pause, if I pause you real uh, yeah, if I pause you real, um, when we when we're talking about DNF, of course, referring to Vesper or valent shell electron pair repulsion, I assume, which is kind of the new emerging model of not emerging, but the model of the atom that replaced the Bohr model, which which we would normally associate the Bohr model of the atom with how we conceptualize the atom. So to bring yeah. You're saying just real quick and um, to clarify, I think what the SPD and F refer to what we normally think of as the circles around the, the nucleus when we look around at the orbitals. Atom. Yeah. And then we're talking about valent shell electron pair repulsion, which is which is where the, tet well, the tetrahedron has been an integral shape within that model of, of the atom for a long time. From what I remember is you, you model the atom and you start seeing this bent shape with water because of the polar interactions. And then you have mm -hmm. a Hedron shape within the Vesper model, and so when you're when you're referring to energy levels, we're talking in one, in two. We're talking about the electrons and their their sphere of orbitals around the nucleus. Correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. Because as you add deuterium nuclei on top of each other, their energies combine. So when you have 
a rotor adding to that generator or that, that stator, and you've got one battery and you've got a second battery on top, the electron that slots into the top spot's got three volts, not one and a half. So it'll spin faster. And the next one above it will have access to four and a half volts. So it'll spin quicker still. So it explains the different speeds, the why it's easier in lithium, for example, to break a, uh, an electron free from the orbital because if it already has a higher angular momentum, it's easier to increase that to the point where the nucleus can no longer hang on to it. And that rotational angular momentum as it breaks free of the constraint of the nucleus then becomes a linear momentum and flows it away at a higher speed. So what we've been trying to model is, is this very nested tetrahedra shaped deuterium um, atom with several layers that plug together like batteries giving them different energy levels. So imagine this top, and this is what I keep doing to a lot of people, and it sort of makes the point, the top has LEDs in it. I don't know how well it's going to show up. You can just see a simple LED. Think of it as an electron on and off, on and off, spin. And as it starts going, you've got to remember that these atoms are spinning as well. So what we're trying to do is we have an atom and we're trying to probe it at various angles with beams hitting it, bouncing off to determine what the spin of electrons is as it rotates. Wow, okay. Very, very complicated model. Yeah. Yet once you know what the model is, it's very simple to put it in a computer, make a CAD model, spin it up, and then model the interaction to get the results that you want and what we observe. But until then, we've got a plethora of models that explain this or that, or a bit of the other like the excess neutrons and all the rest. And why are there islands of stability? In, in atoms because it's just deuterium stacking up on top of itself at different energy levels. So they're inherently stable. They're easy to do once you know that it's just a Lego set of little motors that have been piled on top of each other and that they all snap together and are held together because of these opposite charges all the way up. And my periodic table that I just took down from the walls got a top down view which is a lot like the, when you mark it out, it has the flower of life built into it. But where you can look at that periodic table, you can see the elemental families based on where the, the deuterium atom is positioned in the nucleus. You can see that there's a maximum number of 120 elements possible. After that, you can't make any more. But the map itself, the periodic table itself, even goes down to pointing out what quarks are where in those atoms throughout the entire model it doesn't matter what one you've got you can then ex then use that same model to explode it out as an engineering model so that you can see all 120 possible arrangements i don't know how well that's going to show up but that's an exploded atom same thing as the top but when you nest that all back in and in the way that it normally forms, it forms a more or less spherical shape. But all those 120 deuterium nuclei are there. They follow and if you, energy levels and laws, shells are all there, mapped out exactly as they normally are. But the exploded view also maps out bores and, and um, Schrodinger's electron levels, the, the wave mechanics. Everything's then reunified using that model. So you've got one model that explains all these different things and where the periodic table element families come from is all locked into that purely because that's the point on the atom where the uh, acnoids form or your, your metals form in the outer rings of the greens. I, I went and color coded everything. <laughs> And, and color coding was another process in itself. But in doing so, I had to color code for spectral lines. So it could show why red, why the rainbow produces the spectral lines it does and found another spectral line that they didn't real, realize was there. Um, by following the model, I found a lot more than was ever suspected by myself. Um, there's about 2000 pages now in Principia 
the main book. Um, and it just keeps growing. As I keep applying stuff, it just keeps showing me more and more information and explaining stuff. And a lot has been jettisoned along the way as well. A lot of things that, that aren't needed, like excess neutrons. We no longer need that. We don't have to account for that. Um, we don't have to worry about reverse beta decay. No such thing. We, we can show where the, the um, beta decay itself comes from. All the normal fission processes are, are written up in the book in things in QED. No, it's in the chemistry book. So I wrote them all up as well. Um, I've delved a long way. And every time we have discussions like this, it gives me further food for thought and further places I can go and, and dig a little bit deeper and find new stuff out. Absolutely. No, I, I find it intuitively um, necessary almost in order to grasp these concepts even a little bit that there be this geometrical model of some point by which mm -hmm. to like your or, origami or, or something of that nature that you can physically and tactilely interact with in a way that can yeah. bring logic and, and reason and, and, and intuition into the model, then you don't, then you're not begetting mathematics for the sake of mathematics. You're, you're using mathematics to describe the actual form and function. And so um, that's why I found it so intriguing with your model is, is I know it's geometrically centric and, 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 and necessarily so because we have a hard time looking at these spherical particles. And then when we do look at them, they're in two places at once, or they, they, they have tunneling effects or these things like that. that quantum mechanics has a hard time describing and inevitably mathematics always seems to me, I don't know if this would be your take, but ma the mathematics has to always invent ways around these problems, almost invent more dimensions or invent the, invent the possibility for something kind of outrageous like this. I know that your uh, the tetrionic speaks to the square root of negative one, and we mm -hmm. all run into that problem as an imaginary number and mathematics breaks down there. Um, I wanted to ask you particularly about the square root of negative one in your model and, and what the significance of, of your model is in regards to imaginary numbers in mathematics. Very simple. I'll, I'll explain it as quickly as I can. Sure. Um, Planck's constant has an energy field that's got a, a scalar, it's, it's squared area is, is the scale of energy. Um, if you measure it per unit of time, that's a mass, but it's inductive or inertial makes no difference. They're one and the same. We just use inherited different terminology. We're only in the electrical age recently. But in the middle of that triangle going up there, think of it as, as it's the square root. It literally is the square root of three over two mathematically, but it is the square root that produces the vector force. That's the electric field. And that electric field always points north or upwards out of one of the apexes. You've got a magnetic and a magnetic dipole on one end. And out of that base perpendicular to the magnetic dipole is this square root linear momentum. L linear momentum is MV versus scalar energy, MV squared, so it's the square root. So if you square the, the linear momentum of something, you, you know it's energy. And if you take the square root of the energy, you know what its linear momentum is. And that's all a consequence of the geometry. But equally as we have a positive coin there, the other side of that is actually a negative coin. So we then have the negative square root of the scalar energy. If you make a photon, which is just a positive and a negative, because photons are neutral, you can see that the it has energy or mass, energy momenta, and the momenta points in both directions. Well, there's momenta and momentum. I tend to refer as the omega as momenta and linear momentum as momentum. But the momentum points out in two directions. So light radiates at two directions from its source point. One's a positive and one's a negative. Now, if you were to map the field strengths of that, you'd say you have a zero point there and the electric field builds up to this point of maximum negative and then decreases to minimum negative to become minimum positive, maximum positive, Minimum positive. So you've got a sine wave. Yeah. 
up and down, a complete sine wave in this photon. But equally, at the maximum E field strength, you have a minimum E a magnetic dipole that increases to its maximum when the E field is minimum. So it's cosine. The magnetic field is cosine to the electric field, sine versus cosine, which is just your harmonic wave function. It's, it's exactly what Euler's equation is describing, the relationship of one to the other. But what he was describing more importantly, what came out of it was this square root of negative one, the square root of a negative charge. It's, it's the same sort of discovery as Dirac made when he worked out about quantum mechanics. And he said, well, there must, if the, all this exists, there also must be a negative or an antimatter version of everything that's out there. And sure enough, yeah. there is. There's positrons and all the rest to the, the antimatter equivalent of the electron, just like the photon. Oops, that's electrostatics. That's the photon. Has its own antiphoton, which when you flip it over is exactly the same thing, except opposite charge is moving outwards. It's reversed the charge. So the square root of negative one that Euler talks about and that as a number value is, it has a, a, a discrete value, it's measurable, it's calculable, but it has no description of what it's really telling us. And, and despite the mathematicians saying it's the most beautiful equation, Euler's identity in the world because it contains pi and all the rest, bearing in mind that Planck's constant is pi radians, an equilateral triangle has 180 degrees within it, 360 if you make the photon, so you've got your unit circle, except we don't have a circle, we have a diamond. So you can apply, and it's in my QED book, you can apply Euler's equation as a natural way of describing the harmonics, magnetic as well as electric, within either EM waves made up of photons or just photons themselves. So you no longer have an abstract thing. What you have is, and, and Eric Dollard mentions it when he, he tries to explain Tesla's work, he calls it space and counter space. And, and it's the old story. You can have waves that propagate like this as a hand moving back and forth where the, the normal transverse wave moves up and down, AM, FM, and then if it encounters an electron, it'll make that electron move up and down with it as it passes through. It oscillates, creates oscillations, which is how our radio works. But in the case of Tesla's work what, and Dollard's work, what's actually happening is Tesla changed the waveform 90 degrees so that it's now like this. Instead of transverse, it's longitudinal because the linear momentum of that wave is parallel to its direction of travel. It's not orthogonal. That's a transverse wave. That's a, a longitudinal wave. And the difference that that makes is profound because instead of oscillating the electron, whoops, get my picture back, oscillating the electron up and down like the transverse wave does, what the longitudinal wave does is it impacts it. It creates a rod of force which accelerates the electron. And that moves it in an entirely different way. It doesn't create oscillations, it creates accelerations. And they're two different, they make exactly the same waves. The unified waves, of, uh, equations of Maxwell apply equally to transverse and longitudinal. There's no distinction, distinct, distinction between the two because they are all made up of photons Oops. It's all made up of these, which may in turn make up, join up to make EM waves, or fields of EM waves, electromagnetic waves, exactly the same. But the only difference is that instead of you've got polarized light, it's really hard this way. That's your longitudinal, which acts like a, a razor blade, directs the force through into the object to move it. Whereas our radio waves, have the linear momentum orthogonal 
So when they encounter the object, it makes it oscillate and heats it up like a microwave oven. Microwave ovens will heat things up, make things get hot, etc. cetera. Uh, lightning will blow things apart because lightning is distributing force in a longitudinal direction that just keeps punching away at things. It just keeps hammering. It's not there to heat it up. Any heating is just a byproduct of blowing it apart like you do with dynamite. So we've got a, the basis of a whole new technological, uh, it's, it's not a new technological base. Um, it actually existed back in 1900s. But what happened was to create the longitudinal waves, we use spark gaps and they're noisy and they're cumbersome and they need tuning and everyone thinks, everyone wants things to be lighter, smaller and quieter. So we abandoned spark gap technology and went to solid state um, LC circuits. I see. We use the LCs for our frequencies, et cetera, and for our tuning. And we abandoned this entire other field of, of technology that we could be using. And that's the technology that'll let you transfer information faster than light and do a whole heap of other things. That's the, 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 the means of energy transmission that nature uses throughout the universe. The starlight comes out as, as longitudinal waves, impacts the environment, and then turns back into transverse waves. Wow. So we're completely, if, if you're looking at it from a SETI point of view, if trying to find intelligent life, it's, um, um, it's like we're banging on the rocks and the drums trying to make as much noise as we possibly can. And, and they're just listening for somebody pulling on a piece of string. Yeah. And somebody yeah. pulls on a piece of string. They got no interest in it because we're just making a lot of noise and achieving nothing. We're not showing any intelligence whatsoever. Yes. Yes. No, absolutely. Um, well, that's fascinating. Um, and something that comes up in my mind when you mention sine waves and when you mention longitudinal and transverse waves, of course, just is the idea of E equals MC squared. Um, I went through looking at this equation and looking at not just the variables themselves, but the units of measure that they're associated with. So the speed of light being meters per second and mass being kilograms. So it looks like energy equals, you know, mass moving over time is energy. If you look at this equation, in my opinion, in a squared relationship, which creates a parabolic graph, um, essentially, uh, in its most rudimentary form, and a parabolic graph, a parabola to me that's created when you graph the equals mc squared, that parabola is a part of the sine wave. Um, it's an up and a down. And I was trying to reconcile that ideology by then further looking at the E equals MC squared and looking at frequency times wavelength equals speed of light. So C, variable C is frequency times weight, lambda times nu times mass. So if you have a frequency and a wavelength associated with mass over time, you, you get energy on the opposite side in a squared relationship, um, which graphs as a parabola. Is that, and I was trying to figure out what this meant. Um, and what I mean by that is, to me, it seems like the introduction of light, the photon, the speed of light uh, to this equation is what offset the balance of energy and mass. So if you just had a constant E equals M and with no speed of light in the equation, then you have like a static, non you have a static dueling two things that aren't in motion yet that haven't offset each other to begin this formation of further elements or, or, or this process of, of universe, of life, of whatever. Um, and so when I broke down the units looking at, okay, well, speed of light is frequency times wavelength. You multiply that by kilograms, then you have energy in a squared type relationship. And so I was trying, it made sense to me that, okay, mass is actually kilograms, but with the introduction of light into this equation, that's when you get meters per second and that's time and distance. Um, and so without light to me, it didn't seem like linear dimensions could exist or something. Once you had meters and seconds in this equation, you could set it into motion. You could, you could have three dimensions operate. And so I wanted to just ask your opinion on that per the units of measure. It seems to me kilograms over time and with speed, velocity over time and a mass associated with it gives rise to energy in a squared relationship. And I, I wanted to ask what tetrionics does with that, not does with it in a real deep sense, but more so 
what does tetrionics make of light? We, we talked about the photon and we talked about that is, I was trying to get to how does this two dimensional scalar design wave, how does three dimensions arise out of it? And of course, that's what your model introduces. Um, I just wanted you to get your thoughts on that and, and um, on, the, on the idea of light. And I know, I know I've seen recently that they were able to coalesce photons into positrons in a laboratory environment. So essentially creating matter from photons. Um, I don't know if that's rigorous science. I assume that it is. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion on that, on E equals MC squared and how it fits into tetrionics. I, well, firstly, I've got to give a bit of credit where credit's due because part of my process was obviously writing up a geometric model, unified model. And I put it all out there. And one of the first responses is, that I used to get back quite a lot was, looks very pretty, but there's not enough mathematics. Mathematics wasn't my strong field. So I went, okay, we'll, we'll go add some math back in and I'll try and explain the geometry and the geometrics of each page as we go through it. And I did a dimensional analysis, much like yourself of kilograms and, and all the units out there and, and mass and tried to figure out one of the things that kept bugging me years from school days was this concept of second squared from Newton and things like that. <laughs> How do you square a second? And, and I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And, and at the same time, one of the things I discovered and, and one of the things I keep harping on about is that in physics and science in general, there's no rigid differentiation or there's a rigid definement, but not a rigid adherence to the definition of what or, the difference between mass and matter. In tetrionics, it's very simple. Anything 2D or wafer thin, piece of paper, a sheet of something like that. Some would argue that's technically 3D because it's got a, a depth there, but let's just treat it as a membrane, a soap bubble. One side of the soap bubble has got a positive charge. The other side has got a negative charge. So anything planar, two-dimensional is mass and energy. Anything material or matter-wise has three dimensions because they're made up of tetrahedra. So they, the tetrahedra displace space. And because they're made up of these charged fascia, they also exclude anything from inside them. They, they displace any region of space and any energy in that space region. So it's like a balloon being inflated in an in a ocean. It's pushed outwards and the ocean pushes back in one direction. One direction only, that's part of the gravity solution. So the moment you form a three-dimensional shape in space, the energy, the ether, or the radiant starlight around it will try and get inside it. And when it can't, it creates this pressure against it. The more matter you have, the more push. So the bigger stars and planets have more gravity than small subatomic particles. So I then had to look at, on that basis of mass versus energy versus matter, I had to expand on, Newton, on Einstein's equation. Einstein's equation is a mass energy equivalence. And what it's really saying is that mass is related to energy through the square of the speed of light. And I'm thinking, as I'm working through all this, I'm thinking, well, the square of the speed of light. And we go back to a previous comment I made where I said photons, when they're created, have two directions of propagation, left and right, positive and negative charges. Will always diverge from their point of creation in the middle, and the light beam will always go out. That's why you have a reflector on a torch to get the most like the light cone, energy. like a light cone, too. Like a light cone. Same as a light cone. Yeah, exactly the same. So in one second, how do you map out the region? So if, if we're going to do our measurements in physics in one second, one millisecond, whatever, let's just pick one second. How far does light travel in one second from its point of source? It travels C in two directions out, which forms a diameter, a radius. Pi R squared gives you the circumference of the circle. Except this time, we know what R is. We know it to be the speed of light, pi c squared. 
we don't have to refer to pi anymore because we know it's the shape. So the photon pi r squared becomes for, for a measurement of a region of space. And that's all this is. If you want to measure a region of space and use the unit of one second, anything that happens within that one within that region of space can be modeled and, and measured and calculated and tried to work out a theory on how things work. In Newton's day, a second square, well, I'll come back to a second square in a minute. That's one second, just a flat circle with a, a beam of light propagating outwards. So now we can measure the energy content of the photon in there. Per unit of second, we can measure its, because we've, we've now got a distance, we can measure its linear forces within that energy. So we go from being just a nebulous energy to being matter, uh, sorry, mass and momentum. So energy, this, this can be measured two ways. You can measure this, oops, like it is now, an instantaneous value. And all you're going to measure is the properties of electric magnetic fields and that it's energy. But you don't know what work it can do until you can measure how the force over a distance. Right? So you need that you need the measurement of time. The moment you introduce the measurement of time, you've got C squared in your equations. So then you can relate the instantaneous energy to the time-based mass properties, mass momentum properties, more importantly, but changing momentum is force. So by introducing C squared, which is a circle around a triangle, sounds rather strange and esoteric. Yeah. But put the circle around one or more triangles, be it a diamond, in the case of an EM field or a series of particles, one second, one C squared, is basically almost to the moon. Yeah. The moon is 1.3 light seconds away. So for most of the Earth can be measured in 1c squared. You can then calculate the energy, you can calculate the mass. You can see how far we've moved in our orbit for our linear. So you've got mass, energy, momentum. That's what Einstein's equation is describing. It's describing the equivalence. Whether you measure Planck's constant as a unit of energy, or whether you use measure it as a unit of, of mass. But when you want to measure matter, you've got an additional problem. Yes. Because matter is not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. So that's when you introduce cubes to volume and, and density whenever you get a cube. That's what Rene Descartes did for Cartesian cartography. The another way you can do it is what I did was I went C squared by C squared. I put a circle and then put another circle 90 degrees to the first circle, which creates a sphere, a spherical region of space, light radiating up and down, left and right. So it creates two circles, okay. one C squared, the other C squared. So you've got C to the fourth. They're both a measure of a second. So you've got one second for mass, second squared for things in gravitational field for matter. Then, you know, because it's all based on how fast light propagates, what, and, and it's not Newton's fault. He wasn't worried about light and all the rest of it at the time. He probably pondered on it, but he didn't need it in his equations. And it's caused problems with Einstein because Einstein included it in relativity. It would be more proper to say, light second squared in Newton's equations rather than second squared. But it makes no difference because all we're doing by saying light second squared is we're giving a, you could say um, horse gallop squared, things like that. You could use any unit, but we use the unit of light when it came to Einstein because of other peculiarities that came about. So suddenly this second squared in Newton's work makes sense because we're talking about objects of matter that have gravitational fields and how they interact with each other and how things fall in that. So you've got to use C, square, uh, C to the fourth, as I term it, or C squared squared, 
light second square. So that's the, from tetrionics perspective, there's mass energy and it's associated momentum per E equals MC squared. Yeah. But that's only for mass and matter, the flat stuff, the two, the, the flat world things. Mass and energy, right? Matter is not. Yeah. It's mass is equivalent to energy. Yes, like and so matter. matter. Matter is different because matter is not two dimensional. It's made of exactly. mass and energy. This is where I have so a hard time. It's a three dimensional shape. You have to use second squared or C to the fourth units. And if you look at relativity, you'll see the units in relativity have C to the fourth in it. Okay. It comes out in the mass. That's such a hard thing to conceptualize. It. Yeah, it is hard to conceptualize. And it's easy for me to say it because I spent 10 years working yep. through this you're doing an excellent little, job little, little breakthroughs which then stuck in my brain and went oh well i'm gonna crack that little chestnut now i'm i can put that into my book and i i understand it and it's not that easy because if as you'll see in my work if you look back over historically it's changed quite a lot because until i did the dimensional analysis i didn't have c squared in there let alone c to the fourth and I needed those two things after the dimensional analysis that Otto prompted me to do in order to finish the equation. So now I've got an equation for mass, energy, matter equivalence in space over time. It's no longer space time because everything happens over time. It doesn't, it's not instantaneous. If you want to take time out, it's just an equation of energy in space it's yeah. doing nothing but the dynamics come about through the interaction of mass and matter but mass is directly related to energy and matter contains energy and mass so when it comes to tetrionics and, and the discussions i have and, and you'll see it in the the ebooks i am very particular another quote that came out of all of this obviously is that Mass and matter in English both start with M. Yeah. So yeah. I, yes. I had to write an equation for a mass energy matter equivalence. And if you use the same M, you've got a problem. And so what I did was little M for mass always, capital M for matter. Okay. So yeah. I yeah. Just have capital M's in their names. Things like photons have little M's, bosons have little P's. But everything, mass energy is lowercase stuff except for energy, which is always bold, because it's it's the construct. It is the basic building block of everything. These triangles, just think of empty space, tip a bucket of all this energy in there, because remember that they're just membranes. So all these little triangles can be stacked on top of each other, and you can have enough energy to make the universe smaller than the width of your hair between your fingernails. And you could just release it like a, a called up coin, uh, spring into a section of space that has nothing. Now, space without energy has no mass, has no matter. And without mass and matter, you have no way of measuring forces. So a true definition of space is it's devoid of energy and there's nothing you can measure happening in it. Yeah. So and it's space itself, and people often say, how big is space? Well, it's the ultimate container of nothing. It's just the emptiness into which energy is poured. And because energy has a plus and a minus side on these triangles, those plus and minuses interact. And those interactions create photons of light, bosons of charge, bosons of charge first, photons of light, matter, and this comes back to what you were saying about them creating a small particle that they think is a positron. Yes, that's what I think. Yes, yeah. no, a photon yeah, it's, was it's not turned sure. into Yeah, they'll, they'll actually find they've created a positive tetrion. Because the first thing you can make is four electrostatic positive photons, like four charges. Um, yes. So it's very clear. Oops, those two. Big Bang, and that's one photon. Then you can get another photon. Bear with me as I do this. Our hands weren't designed for that, but you can put it inside out, spin around. 
they did positives. Two positives and another two positives. It's, it's in my QM book. I call it Tetrion Genesis. And what you do is you have two photons coming in to the right. Those two photons at 90, at 60 degrees and another two. I can't hold them. I'm hopeless. But what they form is basically what this was showing us. Once upon the camera. Four photon, four, two photons or four Planck charges form a tetrahedron. Now, the last page, one of the things they say about scientific theory is that if it's a theory, it should be able to offer up um, testable hypotheses, etc. So the last page of every one of my books has got a testable hypothesis and mine relates to the Large Hadron Collider. One of the quirks that modern collider science relies on is that every particle has a unique mass charge ratio. And that's why neutrons are different to, uh, neutrinos are different to um, electrons. Not only their charge, but their masses. One of the sad things is that all leptons are made up of three tetrahedra. If you take the, the mass charge of three tetrahedra and then divide it, that's why you split up the electron into its three constituent, constituent tetrahedra, you'll find that the mass charge ratio is identical. So the tetrion has an identical mass charge ratio, a negative one, an identical mass charge ratio to a electron. A neutral one is the same as a neutrino, either flavor. There's two flavors of neutrino, two types of yep. tetrionics. And the positive one is exactly the same as a positron. So the last page of my work says there's data hidden within the collider experiment results that will show that tetrion that tetrionics is real because the only way to differentiate these the, the positive tetrion from the positron will be when they interact with other matter i.e there'll be less inertia in this because it's one third the mass it's got the same mass charge ratio but its inertia is different and I've got no doubt that if they look through, come through their experimental data, they will suddenly start seeing these particles that aren't, they're stopping too fast. They're going, or, or they're accelerating out at much higher velocities than what they should have for the, the mass of a positron. And that's what they're making with these. So yes, electrons, all leptons have an internal structure, three tetrahedra, which has been hypothesized as well, but they haven't settled down on it and, and worked it out. By the way, for a long time, each charge fascia, as I say, that is positive and negative triangles. I struggled for a name to give them apart from charge fascia and it's stuck with me. Um, it's what the collider experiments could term a Higgs boson. Yes. Because yes. the charge fascia that contains the mass energy of the particle. When you fold this down flat, there is no mass inside the particle. All the mass energy of the particle is contained in its surface area. Nothing's in the volume. The volume's completely devoid, empty. That's why gravity exists. It's gravity is the result of matter forming. It's an emergent property. It's not an inherent force per se. The presence of a 3D shape inside a region of space that has any energy at all in it will create that energy will push back to try and get rid of the volume, get rid of the, um, the vacuum inside. Nature it holds a vacuum, so it tries to equalize it. Like so, yeah. It's always outside will always be higher than nothing inside. So it always acts inwards. Okay. And so the mechanistic properties of gravity being the interaction of three dimensional folding basically yes only begin once you have a 3D particle. You need 3D matter to have gravity. If you don't have 3D matter, you won't have gravity. So trying to mathematically create gravity, that's a three emergent 3D property out of inherent 2D properties of mass energy will only lead to nonsensical things like multiverses and 
gravity bleeding through and a stubbornly persistent illusion. As and, Einstein quoted. And the perpetual, the perpetual invention of alternate dimensions and, and all kinds of, of ad hoc solutions. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll, and keep, so, they'll keep going. Whereas the much simpler answer is as nature always affords it. The much simpler thing is to make a 3D object. It's I the easiest thing I keep saying to people is just imagine a balloon flat, uninflated, in the pool. There's not much pressure on it at all, negligible. Blow it up under the the pool, and suddenly the entire weight of the pool, all the water, is pushing back on it. And the only reason the water is pushing back is because you've created a volume. Pin prick it, just like a submarine, pop, pop, it collapses it. That's what gravity is all about. It's not, and, and stars are predominantly plasma. They're not, and, and this is the other conundrum I had. I, when I came to gravity and cosmology, I knew stars were plasma environments, basically irradiating light and heat out as photons from a source. And I knew the, the Coulombic uh, repulsion explanation that um, Eddington provided to support Einstein was wrong. I'd gone far enough down through relativity at that stage to realize what special relativity was, which was, it was really a description of energy inside an electro electromagnetic field. It's a description of, of electromagnetic fields. The GPS time slowing that they often quote as, as evidence of general relativity, et cetera, is really a photon moving through a changing energy environment. As it gets closer to the earth, there's more energy, there's more particles and it slows it down. It's not using a photon in an energy field, it diffracts it. The starlight isn't bent by, going, by gravity as it passes a star, it's refracted because the star itself has a big electromagnetic field. And as it passes through, it's a changing medium and it bends it. It's not bent, it, the gravity is part of the equation. Where the mistake may came, and look, it's, it's served, so I can't really say it's a mistake. Where the problem started was Newton. Newton looked at the motion of planets and stars and said, what mathematics fits that and explains it and allows us to model it. He was looking at the motion of the moon moving around the earth and the planets moving around the sun and worked out that inverse squared law works. Einstein looked at it later and said, well, Mercury is a problem. How do we fix this? Why is Mercury a problem? Because it's closer to the star's electromagnetic field and it's medium, right? So it's more heavily affected by that. So we've got to allow for those perturbations that occur. So his explanation was the rubber sheet. Tesla would argue that if, if you bend a rubber sheet, you've got to have an equal and opposite reaction as per Newton. Exactly. Right? So well, yeah, reaction. which is what which is what I wanted to ask. Which way is it bending? Is it bending north, south, east, west? I mean, like the curve isn't three dimensional that he's describing. It's a it's a rubber membrane that's being bent. It's it's a flawed analogy, but it still serves as well. It allowed him to create the problems that had plagued Mercury's motion around the planet. So I had two problems. I had into the mix Coulomb's law of interaction, what I call interaction. He called it attraction. I call it interaction because there's equal and opposite charges. They push and they pull, right? So I had his equation, identical to Newton's equation for gravity going, why are they identical? Yeah. And why is Einstein off the side here so successful at big scale stuff, but so helpless at the small scale at the other way around, right? It didn't gel, it's two complete models and nature doesn't work with two different schemes, it works as one. Again, after a lot of thought and a lot of thinking, you come across a lot of other stuff when you read about push-pull models and, and all different ways that gravity can work and has been theorized to work. And what I finally dawned on was in the case of a star, for example, and the earth, the earth has an electromagnetic field around it. So does the star, right? It has a magnetic dipole and has electric fields and they push out creating the solar wind. 
if you're just looking at the motion of the planets and their satellites or the stars and their, their satellites, you're only looking at two objects of matter moving around and saying, what is the force between those two points? You're not, and, and as Newton eloquently wrote, I frame no hypothesis for how this gravity works. It just does. And this mathematics describes it beautifully. Einstein tried to explain it and still couldn't, but he fine tuned it. The inevitable answer to it all is when you create a chunk of matter, the universe pushes back in because it absorbs that the void region in the middle of it. And the more matter you have, the more it pushes back. But that's very weak. Yeah. The force of gravity is 10 by 10 to the 50 times weaker than electromagnetic fields. So add to your chunk of matter an electromagnetic field, i.e. a star with its plasma or a planet with its magnetic dipole, and what you've got is an additional force that wasn't factored in by Newton. He just lumped it all in together. You've got gravity pulling in towards the bigger object, and if the bigger object and the smaller one have a magnetic field, you've got the push-pull of Coulomb's law. Yeah, superseding over the top. They're in both inverse squared laws. Yeah, that, okay. So that's the symmetry. The yeah, symmetry the between the So what you have for what Newton simply described as an inverse square with a big G around a, a star and its, and its satellites or a planet and its satellites or a rocket and the, the Earth, is eloquently put and very simple, but it's simplistic. It's missing what's really going on. With a chunk of matter, you have an inward, strictly inward force that exists all the time, which is gravity, as Newton termed it. In addition to that, you've also got a stronger force that pushes and pulls objects depending on how many plus and minus charges the other object is made up of. On the whole, both tend to be rather neutral. But that doesn't mean they have no charge. That means they've got an equal number of plus and minus charges. And the electromagnetic field still affects the others. So the short, come, the short result of all this is the star puts out a lot of light, right? The yes. gravity of the star pulls the planets towards it. But the pushing of the starlight pushes back against that until you reach an equilibrium between the, the gravity of the planet and the star versus the star's light pushing outwards in the heliosphere. And what's that do? It creates something that's still not explained to this day in celestial mechanics. The pulling in and the pushing out is an accelerative force that gets, that keeps the planets in almost a perfect cylindrical uh, elliptical orbit. Circular orbit, I should say. There'll be changes in that orbit slightly as the star waxes and wanes, and as the, the the planet's own magnetic field waxes and wanes in synchronicity of it, as we get our energy from the star, as it gives us more energy, our magnetic fields build up as well as our electric fields. So that means the orbit's never perfectly uh, circular, but we reach a balance point. And your rockier, heavier planets will be pulled more towards the star because they're heavier and it takes more sunlight to push them away. So they're not going to receive that outward push strong enough until they're closer. Whereas something like Saturn that's very light and light enough to float in a bathtub of water will be attracted in towards the sun, but the sunlight at a further distance will keep it in a stable orbit yeah. further out. Yeah, that so goes to the fine tuning line up, and they all sit there happily going round. Because if you try and explain it, if you try and explain a circular acceleration on the Earth, the first question that's coming up is what is accelerating the Earth to keep it in a circular orbit? Yeah, what was the mover of all movement to begin with? Mm -hmm. Essentially, a Thomas Aquinas religious argument too that that essentially there had to be a mover of all moving, so kind of like the turtles all the way down sort of uh, analogy. That, that what was the first turtle um, that is rested on? Kind of like when you were using the analogy of the D batteries and the tetrahedron stacking. It's like what 
is holding the stack up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you go down far enough, what is down at the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, it, is, what is the clockwork of the universe? What, what wound <laughs> it up and got it started? Yeah, but who's the grand watchmaker anything, here? Yeah, in, in this case, what we've got is now is a explanation for why Coulomb's equation looks exactly the same as Newton's equation. So um, speaking on and, and how we go build into it. I'm um, sorry. Um, yeah, just the, I find it's I actually came to this looking, trying to derive the dimensional analysis of E equals MC squared and, and came to looking at Maxwell's equations and then came to looking at special relativity and the spooky action at a distance phenomena and um, found it intriguing that there was this inverse square law that that persevered through the standard model of classical physics into the quantum model, not so much quantum, but but into the electromagnetic model. And then which furthermore led me to looking at, of course, Tesla was the next step along the way of this to me because it was like, okay, Tesla had this, this dynamic idea of gravity being an interaction of electromagnetism. And sure enough, electromagnetism is the inverse square of the force being put upon it. And so then you look, it just seems too uncanny to me to not have it. The, the pieces are there, but what's happened is there's never been a physical model that everyone's been able to follow to make the connections and to understand. Yeah. Like I said, Tesla, one of the things about Tesla was he said, I can provide infinite energy to any point on the earth. I, I, can, I can provide real horsepower to a tractor in the field. Now, try as much as they want, they can't do it at the moment. They keep trying to transmit energy and they can't. Why? Back to this. We're transmitting transverse waves in all the research centers. What you want, is the longitudinal waves because once you do that you create a string of photons one after the other the same thing sinusoidal waves that link up think of it as a long rope if i stretch a rope from here at home to your studios and then we're both holding the ends taut it's taken us a certain amount of time speed of light say yep to reel that rope out but once the rope's there and you're holding it nice and tight and i pull it you feel that tug instantaneously. Yeah. If you, there'll be people that say, no, 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 no. The physicists are saying nothing moves faster than speed of light in a trite answer. But it doesn't matter if you go to Mars and repeat the experiment, you pull on that end of the rope and that tug will be felt instantaneously. So you can then transmit information and real forces back and forth along that chain faster than the speed of light. Wow. Just by going from transverse waves to longitudinal waves with exactly the same equations of Maxwell's, no difference between those fingers and these fingers. They just point a different way. The inverse squared law comes about because when the fingers point in a transverse fashion, the linear momentum in the wave is expanding up and down as it travels. And as it does that, it diminishes as an inverse square. That doesn't. As that tries to expand out, it's pushing in the direction you want it to go. Yeah. Okay. The action is, is going to from here to the to Mars or where, whatever point you want to pick. So yeah. the information can be transferred as dots and dashes initially primitively, and we can probably find better ways of encoding it faster and faster. But we then go from a um, speed of light based technology to a superluminal one, where once we establish these links, and that's all they are in my parlance as a radio engineer, you put in the link lines to the tower to tower to tower, and then at the base of the tower, you put in a repeater. And the repeater then breaks it back down into good old FM signals, and you talk back and forth. The, the link has gets it from, say, Brisbane to, to Melbourne, but at each end, it's just a, a CB radio that's working that wouldn't work without the link. But once that link's in place, then you can do really fast communications and get good signal strengths and good, good comms. We repeat the process. The satellite and the base stations have longitudinal waveforms being pumped out. And once they're pumped out, they get maintained. The generators keep running. And all you then do is pulse bang, 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 bang. The information down that chain 
and the information is received instantly. So you can talk to Mars, a rover on Mars without a 20 minute delay. You put the satellite in above Mars, one above Earth, you send your normal link up to the Earth one, it talks instantly to the one in Mars down. So you might get a one second delay from the Earth to the satellite and satellite down to Mars. That's better than a, a 21 minute delay. Yeah, it seems eerily akin to the idea of an alternating current, just uh, to me, I don't know, conceptually, because of the way... It's pulse DC. Exactly, it's yeah, pulse. it's Pulse DC, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It seems eerily akin conceptually to the idea of alternating current in the sense that alternating current is flipping its its polarity and, and, and basically moving back and forth this... Right. Yeah, yeah, so it seems conceptually see, akin to... The, the other advantage you can do with this is, is the problem with... Once you know and explain electricity and how it works, you understand that the old conundrum, electrons in a wire move at about walking pace. You flick on the light switch in your room or in the shed and the light comes on half a mile away yeah. instantaneously. Walking speed, you walk down there and then the light should come on, but it doesn't. So everyone's trying to explain how electricity works. Electricity uses just that. You go flick and this field of mass energy flows through the most conductive direction, which is the wires, to the other end, goes from both directions at the same time, out, and then when it's there, it's just like a stream. And the electricity is lighting up the bulb, it's resistive, so it's losing a bit of heat and light there. But once the electricity, the voltage is there, then there's time for the electrons in this stream to go, well, I'm negatively charged and I sh I'm being pushed by a positive charge towards the light. So the electrons are a slow boat that just pick up speed over time and start moving down towards the circuit and come back to complete the circuit. But what's actually happening when you flick the switch is electrical energy flows through the wire at the speed of light to the light bulb, encounters the resistance, and then says, this is resistive. I'm going to lose some of my energy in the form of light. There's no big modern mysteries. I've, I've unraveled, well, I forget, there's about 2,000 pages in my book so far. Yeah, yeah. Every there. single one of them addresses some conundrum or some something that modern science struggles with, some explanation or how to tie it together. And it's all tied back to, as I keep pointing out to people, I'm not looking top down trying to explain things. I'm starting with one simple shape that's got two sides and everything in those 2000 pages is dictated and explained by that shape. I can't make a hexagonal one. I can't make one with rounded corners. I can't change what the inside looks like or th there's equal amount of magnetic to electric. I can explain why that is so electrically as a closed inductive loop. So we have all the information we need to build a brand new technology base on that. And then when you know what stars are and how galaxies work and that gravity is a threefold force, pulling of gravity, push pulling of electric fields that we've only modeled just as the motion, not explaining the mechanics. But once you know how they're working, you know that the stars are arc furnaces. They're not the collapse of matter or fusion devices, which is why the fusion devices in the toroids will spend, they'll spend all the money on earth trying to get them to work and they'll never work. The only energy you'll ever get out of them is incidental energy. We can build a better device that will collapse matter in its raw form back into its constituent mass energy. And that radiates out as photons, light and heat and color. So we then use that all these devices to destroy waste matter around the planet to produce all the energy we could ever need. We don't need to drill for oil or coal or anything like that. We can put raw sewage into this stuff. We can put radioactive waste in it. We can put banana peels into it. A bit like Doc in Back to the Future shows up with the car, yeah. Yeah. the device on the back, throws in the aluminium can and the banana peel. That'll do it. That's all the energy I need. Need about six kilograms to run the planet at the moment because E equals or M equals E equals capital M is slightly different 
the, the thing that's the other thing that confused everyone. When you convert mass into um, matter into mass, the relationship between mass and matter is c squared. So when they say they converted some matter in the atomic bomb into mass or into energy, that sentence is nonsensical because mass and energy are the same. What they're converting is 3D matter back into 2D oh, mass. Wow, that's a that relationship is still the same, still C squared. I like that. That helps it. That helps round out the analogy a lot for me because oh, good. Um, because the analogy of yeah, because atomic bomb, I was that's what made me so bewildered was also looking at dimensional analysis, but going past that of E equals MC squared was the incredible amount of mass of you have a little mass, ton of energy, but really it's not that makes no sense that you're simply splitting the atomic nuclei, simply severing the strong force, and boom, you have the you're, you're collapsing. So you're collapsing you're, it. That's why it's it makes fundamental device. sense. It's an implosion device, which is really scary when you think how many of these devices are out there and they don't have a good idea of the physics that makes them work. Yeah, there's a few of them out there. <laughs> yeah, one or two. No yeah, one or two. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's how science progresses. We make things, we tinker things. Tesla was a great tinker. He, well, he made a lot of things, experimented a lot, but he had no theory to explain his experiments. Einstein, on the other hand, had a theory, but no experimental results. It took a century to get experimental results for his work. So, yeah. And the way, with, with the, talking on this, uh, if, if you don't mind, if I go from that, you were talking on emergent properties of gravity due to the three-dimensional four. This three-dimensional structure, gravity kind of emerges in that. Emerges. Once you have that oh. shape, you need that shape. You need that shape, and I, I wanted to extrapolate from that uh, the idea of emergence and go further, just because I, I know it's getting uh, a little bit lengthy here, but I wanted to, just because I'm, I'm fa I fa fascinating talking to you, and I've been extremely fascinated reading your material. Sorry, but you were the one that they, that does I wanted, I wanted to get your uh, opinion on emergence, and just, I know this isn't your um, applicable directly to your unified theory, um, but I wanted to get your opinion because I rarely get to speak to somebody um, who's developed a theory like this. And I believe you probably have some interesting thoughts on consciousness as an emergent phenomena mm -hmm. in the universe. And I just really, um, aside from tetrionics and all, I kind of wanted to get another person's opinion who thinks mathematically and an engineering mind on consciousness and its emergence potentially, potentially um, within a human being. Is that something that, that you wouldn't mind kind of giving me your opinion on? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. I've, I've had long discussions with Otto because his background is, is a medical doctor. His training was all in medicine and he's been seeking up until he found tetrionics, it's how life comes about. Um, one of the funny things is just like we we're talking about stars having electromagnetic fields and planets having electromagnetic fields, so do we. And if you think of these plank coins, and their duality is a, a plus and a minus charge. Another analogy of a plus and minus charge is one and zero. So if you make a electromagnetic field, and we do it now, the cloud for an, app, for an iPhone, cloud storage, ones and zeros, right? And you make an electromagnetic field that you can directly change the ones and zeros in it to store information you then have a physical form with an ethereal form or an ethereal memory storage device and the way i like to describe it is just like the universe is made up of tiny little motors deuterium nuclei they also make up the human body so we're giant robots in a sense the physical body enter into that physical body a quantum computer in our skull that processes sensory information and gives directions for locomotion and moving about and simulating information and experiences and then the ability to store that uniquely for each person into a cloud drive you then have a human body with this concept of of a conscious soul the soul being the i you have the iPhone and the iCloud, the human body and the soul. The human soul is attached to the human body 
whatever form your DNA gives you at birth, it's there, it develops an ACM as a blank sketch, if you like, blank page, and you fill it up with data. Every experience and all the rest gets filed away into this cloud drive that's stuck in this body until something catastrophic happens to it. You either die or you wear out or something happens, right? Yeah. You're trapped on this earth until that body dies. There's no way off it. Even the astronauts take their soul with them and then bring it back. It's trapped in that human form. So there's a connection. Trying to study the human brain and thinking we will understand consciousness and the human soul, I say is akin to looking at the um, CPU of a gaming computer and trying to work out how um, Minecraft works. Because if you look at the CPU, yes, you'll see the impulses. Yes, you'll see the, the inputs and the outputs and all the rest that go on. But what you're not seeing is the software and where you're not seeing the cloud drive. So a Steam loaded game, for example, all your software is on the, the Steam um, cloud server. You're running it on your computer, but analyzing what that CPU is doing isn't going to give you any real clues as to how the software is written, what's going on, or where the information is stored, because you're looking at the CPU, you're not looking at the hard drive or the RAM. So you've got short-term memory, long-term memory. So that's the way I perceive it, because in the end of my, I think it's my biology books, I've drawn the human body, male, female, opposite electromagnetic fields, explaining the attraction, etc. And then if you think of that EM field, as just a, a cloud drive with trillions upon trillions of, of these little common coins that can flip back and forth. And that's that's where Otto came in. Otto went, oh, at last we have an explanation. We can see why memory can be changed and falsified and manipulated over time, how you can have false memories, how you can have people that have access to incredible amounts of information they're doing on any day of the year perfect memories or we'll be able to look at a picture or a scene and draw it again no problems at all and some people just have trouble processing that stuff i hate mathematics but i can see geometric shapes day in day out everybody's brain their quantum computer processes things slightly differently so you've got a body which is a bit like mit's robotic bodies hopping around moving around with a quantum computer inside it encased that has no stimuli or inputs except for what you can hear, see, taste and touch. And then the brain's purpose is to move you around, let you experience more things, learn, communicate, and then store that information. It's not stored in your brain. Otherwise, people with, um, I don't know the term, but with water on the brain that have shrunken brains, hypo, Celepathy or whatever it is. Yeah, uh, yeah. Encephalopathy, hypoencephalopathy. Shouldn't be able to function medically, but yet a lot of them still can function quite normally. You can operate and remove large portions of your brain and still recover features. It's not necessarily, and, and still you might lose motor skills, but your memories remain intact. Mm -hmm. The memories aren't part of your brain, so you can remove great chunks of your brain what you're doing is running your 16 core PC on down to four or five cores. It'll still function. It'll be slower. It'll play up. It'll crash and all the rest, but it can still function. So you got to, we've got to expand our thinking to look at the EM field that surrounds our bodies. Start measuring that, measuring the information contained in the aura, if you like, for lack of a better word that everybody's per, uh, personal EM field is unique to themselves because that's where the stuff that is you and I that makes us who we think we are is stored. The brain is simply just processing information and allowing us to move about and assimilate information and make decisions. And, and that's, that's interesting because in the field, uh, or I guess emerging uh, field of academia that involves quantum biology, is fascinating in, in its nature because it, it kind of 
came about or not came about, but an, an inquiry into consciousness that, that retains to memory at the most basic level, they started to observe, you know, that, that there's this uncertainty there, obviously in, intrinsic to this um, quantum mechanics. Um, and I was trying to understand free will philosophically and, and this quantum biology um, inquiry they looked at the microtubule functions and then in the cell body of the neuron and looked that deep into the microscopic functionings of consciousness whenever they would inject somebody with anesthesia or administer anesthesia to somebody that obviously keeps an organism biologically viable despite removing consciousness so if you could figure out semi sort of where this mechanism is introdu introduced where interruption occurs at the neuron then you could understand where biologically where is conscious, what's turning the sensory lights on, um, so to speak, and, and making us so much more than just a philosophical zombie, as, as some philosophers call it, where we just would biologically evolve without this sense of self and uniqueness and then attribute an, a, a memory sequence of events to ourself and, and thus, you know, origin of conscious awareness is begun yeah. at that point. Um, and the co potential collapse of the wave function, the superposition, this whole idea that, that, of it, that exists in quantum mechanics, to me, became something like a potential for what we see as will or the choice or the act of choosing is the collapsing of this, of this quantum wave function in the brain and the neuron to choose. We're currently in superposition. And when we choose of choice amongst two, then we, so we collapse that wave function that's superimposed on on reality and then and then we collapse that by choosing a conscious pathway to proceed in where we're currently have the potential to make multiple choices right now we, we're choosing to have this dialogue that's collapsing the wave function of our conscious existence here and now and then whenever we have a multi, we're at a fork in the road left or right we make that choice we we philosophically collapse the wave function of choice giving will and and that 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 potentially occurring at the synapse and in, in this study of quantum biology and so i find that neat um i think it has some potential i just wanted to share that with you uh, yeah, tetrionics has, has a similar thing because because of the the arrangement of, of plank coins within large plank within within the heads boson for example and we go back to this because of of that we remove indeterminacy that's a probability one to 10 back down to one it's not a bell curve it's the natural shape of equilateral triangle stack but it's that's where quantum probability comes about in quantum mechanics because of that tetrionics is is very discrete it's very deterministic it's not like the others there's no collapse of wave function there simply is a wave function but similar to what you're saying at any stage, there is freedom of choice. And the freedom of choice to say, yes, this way, no, that way, it's not so much collapsing the wave function, it's altering the wave function. And, and you're deciding to pick up a pen or push a, a ball is simply enacting a force based on what your PC, what your, your processor has said, okay, in order to do what I want to do, I need to move my hand down to do this. It, yes. There's no, there's no other alternatives. You're just making a deterministic um, decision with deterministic effects or, or impulses to create the desired effect. Um, yes. A lot of people yeah. blow up on the superposition side and then go into the multiverse side. There's no need for that. It, yeah, it is. Just simply, it would be a very boring universe if there was no freedom of choice. It's like a computer game. You can build a fantastic computer game, but if it's just going to run and, and run by a set of rules, everyone's going to watch it for a while and go, I know what's happening, I know what he's going to do, and that's it. But the moment you have the ability to make inputs and change outcomes and, and throw in a bit of freedom of choice, it becomes an exciting computer game. Yeah, it doesn't. That's what I love about Tetrionics is it doesn't... Tetrionics doesn't bring me to anything close to the nihilistic viewpoint of the universe. That's why I'm so drawn to it is it provides almost more intrinsic meaning to existence as we get further into it. And I find that very neat um, because I see the opposite of that occurring in a lot of schools of philosophy where they debate this consciousness issue as an illusory aspect of nature or free will as, a, as an illusion within that. 
And so I, I find tetrionics as a very good, because inevitably I didn't mean to end up looking into unified field theories at all. It was looking into consciousness that brought me to your school of, of tetrionics and in your unified theory. And it's the only one thus far that has been like, okay, checks that box, checks that box, checks that box. And as far as, as ultimately getting to the end of it and not the end of it by any means, but getting to the crux of, of some of these premises talking to you and, it doesn't do anything but build meaning upon meaning and instead of subtracting meaning. And so if anything, it's, it's worthwhile pursuit without a doubt to, to go a route that, because it inevitably it feels intuitive to me that any theory would be geometric in nature and then therefore also would be implicit with meaning in its background. And the can, and, and it seems to me that, that your theory intuitively answers the questions that we feel to be true. And then, Additional to that, it doesn't do anything but add meaning to our existence and, and doesn't devolve the devolve us to creating mathematics and justify eight dimensions for the sake of not being able to find the model. Um, it, it jettisons a lot of a lot of mathematics. There's a lot of dead ends and, and stuff where I've, I've read a lot of books on string theory and a lot of other theories just to try and glean information, try and make sense out of it over time. And what it really did was the rigidity of the model just allows me to go, no, can't build this, can't work that way. Or no, I know what the shape of this is and it, it fits in with everything else. It's got to work this way. And, and that's why I got stuck on chemistry for so long because I had this model and I had to make sense of it. And in the end, the answer was so simple. You just wondered why it took so long to slap myself in the face and realize it. this is how yeah. it works. I'm like oh, yeah. stacking these cell batteries. It's not hard. I'm an electrical engineer. <laughs> it should be in common sense. But it didn't dawn on me for two years that that would make sense. And then the spreadsheets and it all popped out. So I can jettison a lot of the stuff like M theory and string theory, et cetera. And, and that gets me into my own little world of pain and hurt and, and uh, flame outs with a lot of people. But at the end of the day, I often look at it this way. If... It's the old story of a picture paints a thousand words. If, if we were visited by advanced life forms, they're not going to take the time to worry about learning our language. And likewise, any show you've seen of us where we encounter them and they're mathematically based, we've got to learn how to decipher their mathematics and respond. Would it not be simpler if, they were, if you're trying to make first contact just to show up and draw a triangle and say, what does that mean? What, what significance does this have to you? <laughs> yeah. What's the next step? And start the discussion. Okay, they've got a rudimentary idea of, of if we say, show us a proton and we go like that, they go, okay, I'll see you later. But if, if you show, say, show us a proton, you go like that, and they go, well, okay, now a neutron, and you show them this, they're going to go, well, hang on a second. But there's a bit more thought going on here, there's a bit more understanding. And we still don't have to talk. You can be talking in any language you want. It's the shape. Just as mathematics, and, and that's written throughout my books, if mathematics is the language of, of the universe or science, geometry is its grammar. Yeah. yeah. Wrong geometry, and you're just talking gibberish. And that's what's happened. We've started spewing out textbook after textbook full of, obscure mathematics, trying to make sense of things that really have a very simple geometric underpinning. Yep. And when you see the geometry, as I looked at the triangle, I said, well, how do we get a wave, a sine wave out of that? And then I looked at it from the side and I said, oh, the sine wave's inherent. You're just measuring the strengths and yeah, okay, sine wave, cosine, it's all there then. The square root of negative one's there, Euler's equation's there. Um, self similar to electromagnetic fields. Yeah, that's it. Tick, tick, tick. Electrostatics versus electromagnetics. Tick. And there was just so many answers coming out of this one shape. And it's not to say I didn't try fiddling with the shape here and there. Um, I've had people suggest why, why a perfect equilateral? Why not round the corners off? Well, you round the corners off when you make the tetrahedra. It's like this one. It's got holes. It can't seal. So the universe will quickly fill up, just like putting it in a puddle of water, fill it up and you won't have gravity. The universe requires sharp edges, a perfect equilateral triangle to make it work. 
It's not to say in 100 years or 50 years somebody might come up with a better idea. Okay, well, it uh, makes sense to me because Pythagoras and, and Euclid and, and then you look at if physics is looking at the right triangle as the answer. Well, uh, equilateral triangle is half truth. triangles, right? I mean, you got the half the sure. here. So you answered the other half by making it equilateral. So it seems intuitive to me. <laughs> yeah, you get the irrational number, square root of three pops out. And um, the funny thing is, if and it, it is the most bizarre thing you often hear about Tesla significance of three, six, nine. Yes. Well, you could easily say the significance of one, two, three, two, four, six. If you draw that circle around the outside of that triangle, like we talked about C squared, and then draw another circle inside like that one you can just see. So there's a, a circle on the outside, so inscribed and, and circumscribed circles that contain that triangle. If you wanted to calculate the height of that triangle, which is an irrational number, square root of three on two, if you wanted to measure that or calculate it without measuring it, here's the way you do it. You take the radius of the inside circle, which is double the radius of the outside circle, because whatever circle fits inside, you double it to get the outside, or accordingly, what if one fits outside, you can halve it. So once you've got one circle, you know what the radius will be of the other one. If that happens to be one, you know the next other radius will be two. You add the one and the two together, gives you three, which is the square mm. root. I say that, so which is the square root of three, three over two, which is irrational, but, 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 but still regardless. It, it, whatever those measurements are, the radius, one radius measurement, you double it or you halve it, add the two together, you'll get the exact length of that irrational square root. And it gives you the, and it's in relation, in proportion, one, two, three, two, four, six, three, six, nine. Uh, well, it seems like it seems very symphonic to me. Now we just need to find the conductor of this symphony, but uh, it's the, um, I think so that's I'm not the, musical, so that's the sad part. No, but <laughs> I, 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 I probably be a lot better. Um, the gentleman that, um, that uh, I forget his name, but on YouTube, who gives a, an hour long so presentation on Tetrionics in front of an audience. I can't remember him. Uh, he does a very good job. He has a ton of notes that he takes and he puts them on YouTube sometimes. I find it really cool. Um, yeah. uh, I can't remember his name, but um, I can't, I'm trying to remember what some of the phrases that he used and sure. describe. Uh, Oh, oh! I, I remember he had a quote in there about from Schrodinger, how Schrodinger was essentially saying back then that the shape is the fundamental of it all anyways. And, he, you know, he had a quote in there where basically Schrodinger was saying, well, it all comes down to geometrics and the shape being the fundamental, most fundamental aspect of all of this. Um, and, uh, and I found that intriguing that it was Schrodinger in general, I, I have to I have to send you later on the actual quote, but, but it but it fits in nicely with this symphony. And I, I feel like. Uh, it's it's nice to I, I appreciate the amount of work that you've put into this and the amount of content you made available publicly because it's the spirit of science is what you're doing is someone who didn't have this background in mathematics but pursued it steadfastly and, and with open arms to the community to share it and it's um, a, a large amount of work and it's so detailed and um, it gives me a something to look forward to to progress into a study that's that I can maybe intuitively agree with as I as I learn it so I'm finding it neat as I go through it it's it's complex and, and it, but it's but it's sensible and it's intuitive and so I hope that other encouragement from that and into it more and I it's since it's been about two hours I think I'm gonna yeah, I'd like yeah. To, um yeah, but I I wanted to say I I I really appreciate the it helped me seeing the visual nature of it, the tactile nature of it, even virtually. Um, that's that 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 to me feels like something I need to do myself is create these models and play with them. If that makes sense, and it does, it does. You, you them around or something. Um, because there are templates on the web page. You can just print them out and then straight off the printer, cut them up with the presses and a bit of sticky tape. And, it, and, it, they go. and AutoCAD models. I I, I actually do electric design in AutoCAD um, or used to or something like that um, and uh, I try Our YouTube channels got a few videos we put together with um, Diego from MIT he's put everything into um, Fusion 360 so oh, okay 
toolkit there and he's just on the flyovers. You'll see all the animations. Have a check of that because that's really the best way. That'll save you a ton of time making models, but not to say that there's a lot to, not to be gained by making them. I found huge benefit out of making them, seeing them come together. Um, but it's a quick way of, he takes, he's done. It took us a while to find him to get it all done, but it goes from the zero point field, the, the plane quanta, takes you right through to folded DNA and, and folded pro, uh, macro molecules and DNA. Okay, and that's, uh, we've that's done a really neat, it's a neat prospect to me. I, I going through consciousness, I kept getting back to the double helix. Um, mm. The double helix struck me as, in my uh, amateur endeavor into this uh, tricky science, the thing that got to me of consciousness is it's inevitably synonymous with a double helix strand of DNA. Um, it has to be, in my opinion. And, and, all, and I've kind of come to this idea that consciousness became synonymous with life in its own definition and life being defined by the instruction manual contained within this three-dimensional double helix um, and Francis Crick, you know, one of the people who helped observe this double helix actually was a big proponent of speaking on consciousness as much as he could because he knew it did have some intuitive aspect to this three dimensional, this three dimensional double helix deoxyribose nucleic acid that, that they see. Nucleic acids to me are the origin of consciousness somehow because they act intuitively against entropy, whereas you rarely see. Uh, something acting against entropy with an instruction manual that's three-dimensional in shape and so I, that's what really brought me back to, to your model too of geometry is that dna only works if it has this structure there's four only four there's four what g t c and g or yeah. i'm sorry g c and a you know and so you have four components that you're rearranging to create either a a tiger or a human you're still using this same structure if i want to grow an arm from a stem cell i'm going to have to tell it to grow an arm and not turn into a frog Somehow, yeah. or other. and that's it is, as elementary as that sounds, it's critically important to see that nucleic acids beget life somehow and they beget three dimensionalness within the cell. And so, um, I think that there's a connection between geometry, DNA, consciousness, there's a connection between everything. But I've found this a, a, a worthwhile pursuit on consciousness is geometry, and that goes down to the nucleic acid. And so that's what brought me to tetrionics was actually pursuing consciousness and the metaphysics of it through Aristotle brought me to Pythagoras, which brought me to Euclid, which inevitably led me back to uh, physics somehow or another in there and tetrionics. And so it means a lot to me for you to have come on here and talk to me about it because I've been, oh, it's been a good discussion. I was a bit concerned when you started talking consciousness straight away. I thought well, this is going to be a big jump into the, the deep end, so to speak, but we've had a no. good grounding along the way, which is good. And you'll be happy to know that with the uh, central dogma of DNA has been done away with in tetrionics as well. It's, it's a much simpler process where the DNA in Crick's model, he, what he terms the uh, hairy caterpillar is actually what's going on. And it's just the unzippering of DNA to bring about the proteins that we want, which is why the codon table has various multiple codons for the same, um, same amino Peptides. acid. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If if it's a hairy caterpillar with the amino acids sticking out the side, those sequences still apply, but it's only matter of unzipping. You don't need to then do a transcription translation, a mirror imaging to, to reread it and create it. The mere unzippering brings about the, the amino or the protein that you want, depending on how much you unzipper. So, yeah, like our like transcriptase and those enzymes that go and unzip the two strands and then replicate a codon from okay, the then then turn back into the one you want. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. Well, nature doesn't do it. It's it just a, a simple unzippering, and then your your final destination protein or amino is there ready to go because it was always always there. So it's it's back to the Watson quick hairy model concept, which is still a twisted DNA, but it's got the amino is sticking out the side at all times like little runs that go nowhere just sticking out hence why he called it oh, a hairy caterpillar wild okay but he abandoned that for the simpler model of just the double run helix and said well we don't need it we'll do transcription and translation along the way which just just two more steps that you don't need splitting the dna of a, a hairy caterpillar a hairy dna will produce that result 
without having to do translation transcription. Wow. Okay. It's the most simple. And mechanics yeah. nature is always the simplest way. Yeah, absolutely. That's like Richard Feynman would say. He said, if you're if you're working on something in physics and you can't tell the guy sitting on the bar stool next to you what you're doing, then you probably don't know what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I try that even with this, with tetrionics, but as you see, sometimes it, it's such a, a, a stretch from what people have in their minds. The cognitive dissonance introduced yes. by saying it's not a ball. Challenging, it's challenging, spherical approach. Yeah. yeah. But, it, it creates a real struggle, but I mean, like over time, people like yourself find it and others people find it and other expand upon it. And it'll get out there. It'll make yeah, it yeah, it, it will. As, as intuition gets challenged and people are okay with challenging intuition and not being mm-hmm. affected by it, and then that will, be an, that will be an elevation in consciousness required to accept it, but it's ultimately very, very neat and such a worthwhile endeavor. And, and uh, I'm, I'm incredibly indebted to you for putting this on the internet for free in the nature of science, because that's what it is to me, is the inquiry, the inquiry aspect and being able to make it publicly available, I think is cool. I think it's a very neat cause. And I, I think that- It was the only solution I could think of. It had to get out there, simple as uh, that. More to okay. more. One, yeah. one thing I wanted to ask you to end on was just, first of all, the, the significance of the two triangles. It does formulate the symbol of the Star of David. Uh, yeah. Positive uh, and negative. Yeah. Is that a is that a coincidence or did you start with that, Shay? I mean, I don't, I've I've done enough tetrionics now to know that there's no such thing as coincidences anymore. And and the more you absorb tetrionics and the more you understand how nature works, you suddenly realize that this is all planned. Yeah, this is a fine tuned universe. Um, I'm not saying intelligent design. I'm just saying. Somebody's poured a bucket load of electrical of equilateral energy into a region of space. Yeah. Knowing that this outcome will come about. And you know it because you know that the opposite, the, the three laws of tetrionics just say energy will seek equilibrium in all its states. Um, opposites attract, similars repel. I mean, like, and, and there is no such thing as infinity, there's only eternity this universe once you release energy into any region of the universe enough energy it will create carbon it will create planets stars that will go on and when you look at the big picture of it all the entire universe is is breathing i mean like one of your other questions that we didn't even touch on was dark matter dark matter dark energy and again back to electrical fields of of Coulomb's law of attraction and, and, and repulsion, you also have admittance and impedance in electrical circuits yeah. where electrical flow will go through. If you think of the, the two directions of attraction and, and divergent, convergent attraction, repulsion in Coulomb's fields, and think of a galaxy, a universe as an electromagnetic field, it's only natural that objects within that field are going to be pushed and pulled by the impedance and admittance of the electromagnetic field that surrounds it. So cosmology looks at things from a magnetic perspective. They, they don't want electrical currents running through, and that's a whole nother discussion for another day if you want. Yeah. Um, but the, the short answer is dark matter is simply the attractive, the convergent part of that electromagnetic field drawing matter towards things and when you have energy that's being released the star or whatever as it's releasing energy dominant over the convergent is the divergent component which then pushes things apart and our measurements would just say that that's and because they're not looking at it as an electromagnetic field they're just saying there's this force that is pulling things together dark matter we don't know what it is because it's not regular matter. Well, it's not matter. It's the EM field of the universe or the galaxy that you're in. What does that mean? What? That's Sorry, why the that. stars orbit at the speeds they do on the outside of the galaxy because they're held inside the galaxy's electromagnetic field. The spokes of the force radiate out along the central, creating the spiral arms and hold them in place because of that force we spoke about. It's instantaneous. It holds them there. As the, the stars put out more energy, it pushes out that region of space, pushes out against it. That's dark energy. As they reduce their energy, they shrink back in. That's dark matter. 
you get this holistic waning and waxing of the universe through its electromagnetic fields. And that's how the galaxies are held together. And then equally, you can have stars that are uh, matter stars, you can have antimatter stars, and you can have, whoops, just like these models here, you can have neutrons and anti-neutrons, opposite charges that come together to make neutron stars, which don't behave the way they think, because there's no degenerate matter, if you remember what I said. Yes. Degenerate yes, matter does not exist. So that, that way, they operate just the same as an ordinary star. In fact, the entire universe could be islands of matter galaxies, antimatter galaxies, and neutral matter galaxies. There's a symmetry and a balance to everything in the universe. But at the end of the day, matter, dead matter is collected up in stars to be reborn as light, to reinvigorate this dark matter, dark energy motion in the galaxies, to reinvigorate and keep planets alive, our souls alive and nourished. So I call it a dynamic, constantly evolving, eternal universe. It's a yeah. circle. Because it's a dark, circle. Okay. All so matter will always come back into the stars to be reborn as light, which will always form more matter. And the consequence of this positive and negative charges when you release them will always create chemistry, which will always create life on planets that are in orbit about stars that are pushed and pulled, attracted to stars and pushed and pulled in circular orbits. So you know from the outset, putting all this energy into a unit, into an empty space is going to create conditions for life throughout the universe. We're not alone that there's going to be many, many planets out there with life forms. I'm all speaking different things, doing different things, caring about the universe to varying degrees, but it's a clockwork deterministic thing that happens once you release the energy and, and as I said to Diego, our next model will be just to pour in, pick a number, 10 trillion triangles, throw it into a supercomputer and just give the supercomputer all these triangles with one simple rule. Opposites attract, similars repel. Electric, electric is different to magnetic. And on that basis, deuterium will form, atoms will form, stars will form, planets, life, all in the simulation. Oh, and then yeah, no, you're only one step sense. away from creating your own planet, your own star. Once you know all this stuff, we, we go tetrionics, understanding and geometry, particularly, will give us an understanding to take the next leap technologically from where we yeah. are now. And the cosmic microwave background kind of gives some light to this, uh, no pun intended, because the cosmic microwave background is a I've been thinking intuitively that it has to have significance to tetrionic somehow or another. It just has to, to me. I haven't thought, I haven't. There's a lot of things I keep meaning to explore. Sometimes work distracts me too much. Oh no, no and I, I could be wrong. I don't know much about what I'm talking about when I get, when I'm saying new stuff, I, I just, I've always been fascinated with the cosmic microwave background. I've always had an issue with the way that it's explained in physics as being this initial light that's been stretched out mm -hmm. Photograph, yeah. w map telescope to me it's more than that to me it's a fingerprint of of this of, of the creator or of the energy whatever I don't know, so esoteric but the cosmic microwave background i think has some tetrionics model can it's something there it seems to me intuitively that they would connect to each other in a way that would even further your 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 premises honestly it's it's similar to like you said with the star of david i didn't intentionally go that way but Overlaying a positive and a negative charge brings you that way and allowed me to do a lot of cool symbols. Um, but I'm just trying to think exactly where I was going to go there. But um, it's, it's an outcome that that is there. Everybody knows the symbol, religious or sacred geometry wise, otherwise, just like they know the seed of life and the flower of life. But the cool thing about the Star of David is when you see what carbon 12. And, and carbon itself is carbon 13, 14, and it's different energy forms. It forms the Star of David. And the elements of the seed, if you like, the, the um, seed of life. And then it can also be overlaid in as obviously because it's deuterium, it can then be six deuterium, I should say. It can then be overlaid in the flower of life. So you get this connection to a lot of 
passed down sacred geometry, um, Star of David, hexagrams, etc. And that Le Leonardo da Vinci's the Druvian this, this stuff, yeah, it, it all links in in ways that you, you just I never dreamt. I mean, like, yeah, just um, I wanted to keep seeing things pop out, and you go that maybe that's what it was all about. I'm like, I'm not the first to discover the, the triangles in triangles. Athanasius Kirchner, back in the 1660s, Jesuit priest, same time yes. as Newton, and, um, and um, Leibniz came up with celestial mechanics and calculus. He actually published the same thing, but mirror reverse as far as linear momentum and all the rest. And it was completely ignored. So who's, who's to know? We may have another 300 years on our hands before this gets fully recognised. But I've, I've just tried to put in as much information as I can, make the connections and let the dots lead the way. Yeah, yeah, no. And and, and I, I think that the sacred geometry aspect of it is very fascinating and it's symbolically so. And and one of the, just to, not to keep dragging this out, I had one... Mm -hmm. I, Found it really fascinating to the Vitruvian man, um, Leonardo da Vinci, with yeah. wearing the circle um, and the triangles and that. And also, I looked at that as a plan view, almost looking down at a blueprint, uh, a two dimensional blueprint of a building instead of a, maybe a section view or something. But looking plan view at a blueprint, if you look at the Vitruvian man in that same fashion, it is a model of somebody ultimately, a man ultimately trying to square the circle, as they called it, as the Egyptians called it when they were building their pyramids. Um, and then if you look at it like that, the structure of it actually looks like the brain um, and, it, and his hands reached out like it is. It divides it up into the model of the low brain that we have right now um, and hemispherically. And it has a circle within a square, but it's not the man can't quite reach his legs down to the circle. It can touch the square. It's symbolically there. That's kind of esoteric in its meaning. But it the Vitruvian man really encapsulates a lot of what you what you kind of say to me personally when I see um, and. I think of the brain as in, since you have such a redundancy in the left and right hemispheres, um, laterally, you, cause you can't really cut, you can sever the two hemispheres vertically, but you can't make a horizontal cut in the brain without actually killing the organism. And so you, you're, you have this hemispherical redundancy. And then if you look at the Vitruvian man, it models that perfectly when it has a circle and a square around it. But on top of that, the brain begins to look like a parallel circuit. Um, it begins to look like a schematic of a parallel circuit with a point of connection in the middle, almost, almost too much wi wild to me, really, um, because I've started to look at the brain and the, the evolving dynamic model of the brain, where it's not so much lobe-based, where cognition occurs here and, and, and visual cortices occur here. It's, it's a multitude of a network-like model, where there's multiple forms of communication occurring all the time that are beginning consciousness and cognition. And it's not this particular one for one, this lobe to that emotional state, vice versa. Um, and because of that, that, that reminded me of the theory behind a parallel circuit, because you've got multiple routes for the electrons to travel and the brain models that. And then the Vitruvian man's geometry encapsulates that further and, and merges with your tetrionics idea even more so to me. So I just wanted to say that because I think you would, it's pretty neat looking into the Vitruvian man, how it really does seem to me to be integral to almost everything you say <laughs> in, in, in your geometry. So I, I just wanted to point that out in case in case you would be fascinated to look into it potentially. I will. I will. I'm like the, the, the funny thing is the more you look, the more you keep seeing connections. Yeah. And I mentioned once the Richard Blankenship. I mean, I often there's days where I'm just a bit quiet, having a bit of a Zen moment. And I'll look at it and the basic comment that often comes to mind is, my God, it's just all my other triangles. All yeah. of nature, wherever you're looking, it's it's all because of the triangle. All this myriad of forms and shapes and resources and everything we can do on this little blue dot. Or, and, and the fact that it exists at all and we exist is, is just the power of a triangle. Yeah, no, I agree. I've been having some more thoughts, but but I, I couldn't problem. be more I couldn't be more grateful to you, um, and Mr. Abraham Ford for joining me tonight. Thank you. Uh, it's actually in the you're in the future uh compared to me so <laughs> I, hope, I hope it's going well over there uh yeah, yeah a bit wet but apparently it's gonna get wet we'll uh, uh, all right well I, I uh i thank you so much for you spending so much time with me and i look forward to, no to you, yeah. talking to you in the future and of course um 
I will be looking further into all of your stuff um, with, yeah. with intrigue and uh, a lot of curiosity. So thanks. Thank you very much again for joining me today. And uh, I will, I'll let you go for now, but uh, it's, it means the world to me that you came on and uh, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Not a problem. Anytime you want to chat. All right. Thanks, Abraham. Have a good one. Okay. Thanks, Abraham. Bye.